Hello everybody, I'm Sandy Vagnozzi, a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. And today I'm going to tell you about two of my recent works, which have looked into consistency tests of Lambda CDM from both early and late times, and what we might learn from this test about the Hubble tension. So one of the things which always strikes me when I think about the Hubble tension is first of all, how vast the theory model space is. There's theories being proposed every day, uh, probably we can say safely, none of which work uh, completely. And at the same time, if we forget the Hubble tension, Lambda CDM seems to fit the data really well. So the question is, do we really need new physics? And if so, at what times and with what ingredients? And I think these questions motivate consistency tests of Lambda CDM, both at early and late times, which is what I'll talk about today. At early times, I'll focus on the early SW effect, and at late times, on the ages of very old astrophysical objects. So it's always important to look at tensions and problems with uh, different eyes. If we focus on the Hubble tension, for example, just looking at H0 on its own sort of obscures the real story. We get a more complete picture when we look at the role of BAO measurements and of the sound horizon especially. So you see that it appears that a model which uh, solves the Hubble tension should lower the sound horizon by about 7%, going from the blue contours to the, to the black X. One prototype model which achieves this is early dark energy by enhancing the expansion rate just before recombination. And uh, the important thing is the Hubble tension is a roughly five sigma tension. So if you want to solve it, you need a substantial amount of uh, early time new physics. One example in the case of early dark energy is you need roughly 10, 12% of the energy density of the universe being in early dark energy around matter radiation equality. Now that's a huge amount of new physics. So the question here, this text is, why is there no clear sign of new physics in the CMB alone if there is such a huge amount of it? So this begs the question, which I anticipated earlier, why does Lambda CDM fit the CMB data so well? And this in turn motivates early time consistency tests of Lambda CDM. And I'll discuss one such test based on the early ISW effect. And it's useful to think about the usual line of sight approach to uh, CMB perturbations. So um, I can decompose the temperature and isotropy field into various source terms. Okay, you have the Sachs Wolf term, which is the relative redshifting or blue shifting of photons on the last scattering surface. You have a velocity Doppler term, you have a polarization term here. And what's going to be of interest to us is the integrated Sachs Wolf term, this term in red. Now, this term you see comes from the time variation of the gravitational potentials phi and psi. So it gets two contributions, two, two contributions at different epochs. At late times, when dark energy dominates and potentials decay, and at early times, when the universe was not fully matter dominated and potentials also decay. Because remember, in the present, in a fully matter dominated universe, potentials are constant in time. Now, um, I think you can easily convince yourself that if you have a substantial amount of new physics at early times, you should leave an imprint on the earlier ISW effect because it's going to change how potentials uh, grow or decay with time. And this motivates an earlier ISW based consistency test, which I did in this recent paper. And the test is really simple. Let me take the early ISW source term and let me rescale it by a scaling amplitude, a fudge factor, which I call A E I S W. And let's check whether within Lambda CDM this is consistent with one, okay, from Planck data. And if this looks familiar, it should indeed, because it's reminiscent of the better known A lens, which rescales the CMB lensing power spectrum amplitude. And it's also a very important consistency check. So just to show you what happens if I change the early ISW amplitude, you see you uh, increase or decrease power, especially around the first peak, which makes totally sense since the modes which uh, most affect the early ISW are those which, um, which are around the, the scale of the first peak. And you see the early ISW template, let me call it, has limited support for multiples greater than about 400. This is good because we don't go into the details of possible you know, funny features in, in Planck data on smaller scales. These this large scales are very well measured by Planck. 
and WMAP and are consistent with each other. So, so it's good that the early ISW only probes these scales. So the question is, from the data, is uh, a minimal lambda CDM plus early ISW amplitude model consistent with the early ISW amplitude being one? And the answer is yes. If I constrain this model against Planck temperature and polarization data, you see that the early ISW amplitude is inferred to be 0.988 plus or minus 0.027. So it's perfectly consistent with the standard value of one. Also important to note is that none of the parameters none of the other parameters shift considerably. The shift are by no more than 0.3 sigma. And uh, the biggest shift you see for the two parameters, which are most correlated with the early SW amplitude, that's to say the scalar spectral index and the baryon density. But as you can see by I, the shift is, is really small, OK? So that's a very good uh, indication that nothing funny is happening as far as the early SW effect is concerned. Now, it's important to check the robustness of these results against either different choices of data or likelihoods and an extended parameter space. In the case of different data and likelihoods, I checked uh, how these results are stable against a different choice of Planck high L temperature likelihood, in this case, Kampsbeck versus Plick, or the addition of external data like uh, BBN, BAO, and top of low supernovae. And in the case of extended parameter space, I checked the stability against minimal extensions to allow, for example, an effective, the helium fraction, the running and running of the running of the spectral index to vary. And as you can see from these two plots, the result is perfectly stable against this, all these choices of data and model. Okay, so the takeaway message here is that Lambda CDM robustly passes the early ISW consistency test. And now, the other important thing is that this is going to present an important challenge for early time new physics, okay? which is going to modify the early ISW effect. And let me show you one worked example I've done in the case of early dark energy. Now, the success of early dark energy is the fact that it can fit the CMB data perfectly with a higher H naught, but this comes at the cost of an increase in the dark matter density omega C. And a series of recent papers using uh, weak lensing and galaxy clustering data have argued that the fit to this data is worsened in, in early dark energy because precisely of this increase in omega C, which uh, basically exacerbates the SA discrepancy, which is already present in lambda CDM. Now, let me show you this work example here. I can see the three cosmologies, a lambda CDM cosmology, an ED cosmology with high omega C, and one with low omega C. Now, if I compare the first two, you can see they give you essentially a, the same uh, CMB power spectrum. It's basically indistinguishable on, on scales which are not swamped by cosmic variance. So that, that's good. That, that's why EDE works at first glance at the cost of a roughly 20% increase in the cold dark matter density. So why is this increase coming about? It's um, useful to extract only the early ISW source term of the CMB anisotropies. Okay, so if I consider the early dark energy model with low value of omega C, you see the early ISW source term is about 20% uh, larger than lambda CDM. Okay, and uh, this excess early ISW effect is of course completely excluded by the data, as I've shown you before. Now, if I raise omega C by about 20%, you see the early ISW access is reduced uh, to no more than roughly three, 5% on the scales of interest. And therefore it's consistent with data. So uh, the point here is that the increase in omega C, which is needed for early dark energy to fit the CMB data well, and which has been argued to worsen the fit to large structure data, to worsen the SA discrepancy, comes about precisely because of the early ISW effect. You need to match the lambda CDM amplitude, which is perfectly consistent with data. Now, this is not a problem only for early dark energy, but more generically for any model, which increases the pre-recombination expansion rate. So let's just recap what we've seen so far. I've argued that early time new physics is expected to leave an imprint on the early ISW effect, which however is consistent perfectly with the lambda CDM expectation. The amplitude is consistent with one, and this is an important challenge for early time new physics, such as early dark energy. 
So, so what does this mean in the bigger picture of the Hubble tension? It means that this is a problem for any model which increases the Fermi combination expansion history. So the point is we might need new ingredients to fully solve the Hubble tension with early time new physics while maintaining a good fit to all other data, which is something we sort of knew already. There might be a relation to the essay discrepancy. And this might also explain why it's, it's been very challenging to go beyond H naught of about 70 or 71 with early time new physics alone. And there's another interesting consistency test, which we heard about, about at a conference last year from Oliver Philcox. You can infer H naught from the full shape galaxy power spectrum using only sound horizon or only um, equality scale data. And the two inferences are consistent and this is a strong consistency test for there being no, no funny evidence for new physics before recombination. Okay, so I think all these ingredients together are painting a common picture where it's, it's very difficult to solve the Hubble tension with early time new physics alone. And, and one of the reasons is that there's no clear signs of this new physics in the data, especially CMB data alone. So, so far, this was for early time new physics. So what about late times? One question which has always bothered me is, is Lambda CDM really all there is at late times? So I would like to try and test Lambda CDM making little to no assumptions about early time new physics and possibly learn something about H naught in the process. And one way to do this is to use the ages of very old astrophysical objects. And these are interesting historically between the 60s and the 90s, before the discovery of the accelerating universe from supernovae, old objects at high redshift provided the first hints for the existence of dark energy. So basically, you had objects at high redshift which were too old to be, to be there. They were older than the universe itself. Now, the thing is, um, if you threw in dark energy, then you allow the universe to be older and therefore accommodate these objects. Now, the question is, what can all the astrophysical objects do for us in the 2020s? Now, if you stare at the age redshift relationship, you notice something really interesting. This relationship goes like one over H naught uh, at, at all redshift. So this means the following. If I can identify all the astrophysical objects at, at uh, several redshift greater than zero, I can say that these objects cannot be older than the universe, of course. So this allows me to set an upper limit on H naught. Now, the really interesting thing is this H integral gets most of its contributions from late times, from Z roughly less than 2015 or so. And therefore, it's totally insensitive to what you assume about early time cosmology. So this allows you to perform a late time consistency test for Lambda CDN without making any assumption about the early time expansion. Now, the catch here is that it's, it's really hard to estimate the ages of astrophysical objects at high redshift. And this is a caveat you will have to keep in mind. So why is this useful in the context of the Hubble tension? Well, of course, it's very useful to get an upper limit on H naught, of course, and check whether it's consistent with the local measurements. And if it's not consistent, that could be an indication for the need for non-standard new physics at late times or, or even locally. And the conclusions will be totally independent of early time, of anything assumed about early times. And let me just point out that uh, the important role of the age of the universe today has been recently pointed out in, in these two papers by the groups uh, in Barcelona and Johns Hopkins. Now, what we did in this work was we went through the Kendall's galaxy catalog and uh, we, we looked for what were the oldest objects at, at any redshift, okay? And we selected only the oldest ones and we also looked at the catalog of quasars, mostly from SDSS, for which we estimated the ages via growth model. And this is the age redshift diagram we constructed of our old astrophysical objects up to roughly redshift eight. Okay? And then we use this diagram to set constraints on uh, H naught, among other things. Now, there's a slight complication in that um, of course, these objects don't form at a big bang, okay? They form sometime after. And this delay time between the objects forming and the big bang is called the incubation time, okay? So you have to marginalize over it. So what we did here is uh, we assume lambda CDM and late times to perform this consistency test. And we have a three parameter model 
determined by H0, omega m, and this incubation time. And we can train this model against this, uh, this ages I've shown you before. And we get something really interesting. We get an upper limit on H0 at two sigma of 73.2 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which is in roughly two sigma tension with the local measurement from Cepheid calibrated supernovae. That's interesting. So what are the implications of this? Again, the, the huge caveat, if you believe this ages of uh, galaxies and quasars, possible explanations are the following. It could be that lambda CDM is not the end of the story at low redshift. So you, need, uh, you might need new physics, which might have something to do with dark energy, for example. It might be that there's nothing wrong with lambda CDM at late times, but you need local new physics, or you might need a combination of the two. Or it could, of course, also be the usual boring fluke or systematics. Now, if we believe number one, it could be that the answer to the Hubble tension is a combination of early time new physics, mostly, and a bit of late time new physics. So this could also be the reason why with early time new physics, it, it seems hard to get above H0 of 70 or 71 without running into problems with other data. It might be that a missing piece to get from you know, 71 to 73 comes from late time new physics. This might very well be the case. If we believe number two instead, it might be that the Hubble tension is not cosmological in the sense that it's not about early time versus late time measurement, but it's about local versus non-local measurements, okay? Now, let me just point out that there are several other independent hints from these papers I've, I've mentioned here that pre-recombination new physics alone cannot solve the Hubble tension, okay? There's hints from, you know, late time data analyzing the model independent way, there's hints from um, the, doing the same with early time data. And I think overall, this is painting a common picture where it looks like the Hubble tension is not, is not a simple problem. The usual mantra of the Hubble tension calls exclusively for early universe new physics might be wrong or incomplete. We might need, you know, a, a, the puzzle has more pieces than just early universe new physics in, in my opinion. So let me now draw concluding remarks. I think uh, the Hubble tension model space is extremely vast, and this motivates more general consistency tests to identify promising directions where we need to operate. At early times, there is no sign for new physics in the early ISW effect, which is one of the places where early time new physics should show up most clearly. In late times, there's a slight discrepancy between the ages of the oldest astrophysical objects and local age not measurements, okay? So um, overall, this paints a very interesting picture for the Hubble tension, I think, where it's clear that early time new physics alone, in my opinion, cannot solve the tension. Now, I would like to ask you, after you heard this talk, do you think that early time new physics alone can solve the Hubble tension? And I would love to hear your thoughts in, in this poll I've linked. So with that, I, I finished and I would like to thank the organizers for accepting my talk. And I look forward to this conference, which is sure going to be great and to the discussion session. So I'll see you there.